Hi again, I'm Jack Lessonbury, and welcome to Politics and Prejudices, the podcast. For many years, I wrote an award-winning column, Politics and Prejudices, for the Metro Times, and did radio essays in both public and commercial radio. But now it's a new era, and I hope you follow me on this new format. By the way, I'm still doing a lot of writing, and you can view my work and listen to past and new essays and podcasts on my website and blog, LessonburyInc.com. It's ink as an ink pen. I've been doing journalism in many different forms since Jimmy Carter was in the White House. I've covered everything from the Jack Kevorkian saga to presidential elections to the struggle for freedom in Eastern Europe. And for the last decade or so, I've specialized in Michigan. I've been around in a while, which is another way of saying I'm older than dirt, and I've met a lot of fascinating people. What I want to do on this podcast is bring some of them and their stories to you. Plus, give you my unique and sometimes snarky take on things, glorious old curmudgeon that I am. By the way, I plan to end most of these podcasts with my signature essays, so please settle in and listen. Hope you enjoy today's podcast. Also, please follow me on my blog again, LessonburyInc.com. I'd also love to hear from you in terms of a message on Facebook or to my blog. But now for today's story. We all know that Detroit's coming back, or at least doing far better than it was just a few years ago. Much of the time, we're hearing about Mayor Mike Duggan's plans or things big developers like Dan Gilbert and the Illich family are doing, and most of it's in downtown or what's now being called Midtown, the former Cass Corridor. But today, I want to introduce you to two young guys who started out with no money, no connections to speak of, and without college degrees, who are accomplishing amazing things. Eight years ago, Andy Diderosi, then 24, dropped out of Lawrence Tech, bought a used bus, and started giving kids in the Detroit Public Schools free rides to class. Today, the Detroit Bus Company includes 15 buses, and uh, besides giving kids and other needy folks tours, it also runs a growing series of public and private tours, including Drunks of Antiquity, a pub crawl through the four oldest bars in Detroit. A.J. O'Neill has a different background. You may have heard of the novel, The Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea. Well, Andy was a roofer who fell off a roof, bounced off a truck, and almost died. When he recovered, he first started a Ferndale restaurant called A.J.'s Cafe, and briefly got in the Guinness Book of World Records after a series of marathon singing contests. Maybe if we're lucky, he'll give us a few bars later, but now he's the founder and CBO, or Chief Bean Officer, of Detroit Bold Coffee, which is selling a ton of beans a week and employing folks in beaten down Highland Park. When the Democratic presidential debate was here in Detroit in July, he was chosen to supply coffee to the national and international media. So these are two amazing guys. AJ, Andy, welcome to Politics and Prejudices. It's great to have you here. Hello, hello. Hi, Jack. So, uh, Andy, since you're youngest, uh, you're younger, we'll go first with you. How did you ever get the idea to start a bus company? Well, I was, I was really frustrated with the state of public transit here. You know, for folks who live in the area, they already know public transit in the Detroit region is terrible. Right. Uh, you in know, the city, worse than anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's two transit agencies. There's DDOT in the city, and then there's SMART for the rest of the suburbs. And no one really works together that well. Recently, they're working together better. But in 2011, it was atrocious. You know, uh, DDOT was run by all consultants who really didn't care about what they were doing. Uh, this was before the bankruptcy and yeah. uh, all of that. Yeah, it was dark times. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, we were about to have this uh, this this train line running from the city up to the burbs, uh, you know, the M1 rail, and it was supposed to be a transit project right. um, compared to what it is now. And, uh, you know, the Fed announced in November 2011 that the project was dead. They right. weren't going to fund it um, because there wasn't any co- uh, collaboration between the, the suburbs and the city, and there was no regional transit authority, you know, it was all bad. So... Um, as kind of an act of protest, I bought an old school bus from Ferndale Public Schools, uh, and I decided I was going to run the same route to prove that, you know, this isn't that hard. Right. Anybody can do it. You know, if a 23-year-old something can uh, uh, run a school bus, you know, a whole region can. Uh, I felt it was a, a, a coordination issue, you know, not a resource right. issue. So um, I did that and uh, had a lot of public response. With the, the, it didn't work financially because it was I just charged five bucks to ride all day. Uh, right. Whereas this, the the city agency, you know, they get the twenty five to thirty bucks uh, per rider uh, in state and federal money to do the thing. So, um, you know, we ran that for a few years uh, um, alongside other services that we were starting up. You know, charters and tours, uh, and we started to find that those were how we could support our mission of public transit. So instead of riding uh, uh, one of our buses and paying a fare, um, and you know, leaving a lot of folks out who can't even afford the five bucks, we'd rather um, sell things that people really enjoy, uh, right. you know, charters and tours and uh, weddings. You know, we do a lot of wedding buses and stuff, and then give the transit away to uh, the people that need it. You know, so the so you have the 
the tours and the for-profit stuff that fund your ability to give kids rides to school. Yeah, exactly. It's like a Tom Shoes model, and they call it the one-for-one, one, where you wow. you know you buy a, 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 a you know medium margin thing, uh, and then we're able to just give the rides away rather than trying to charge uh, kids or parents or programs who who just don't have the means to do so. Um, this allows us to provide transit to the most you know most needy, uh, the folks who are most most vulnerable, rather than the ones that can uh, you know pay a couple bucks. It's not on this scale, it's not worth the couple dollars per ride. You know, we'd rather think right. about it in a, in a larger it's kind fashion. of capitalistic socialism or something like. That. Yeah, it's really hard to put a pin on it. You yeah. know, we've had the the libertarians try to you know put us right. on their uh, put us on the cover of their magazines, and I'm like, it's not really like that, right? Um, because there still needs to be public transit. We're not trying right. to compete with the public transit agency. How the uh, public transit people regard you? Are they as he was a threat or? Uh, no, no. Um, right when I got the bus company started, um, the city gave me a public or a Spirit of Detroit award, you know, wow. which is not the Nobel Prize, but it's a, um, it's a good recognition. And then uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, Mayor Duggan appointed me to the uh, Transit Commission. Wow. Um, so, uh, you know, we meet with DDOT quarterly and, you know, see how things are shaping up and I uh, get a bus pass. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's been, it's been great to work alongside the transit agency. They've, they've helped as much as they can. Um, you know, they have really rigid, um, uh, formula on how they can spend their dollars and how they can support things. And that comes largely from the fed. So, wow. Um, how many kids do you give a ride, rides to these days? Oh, well, it really depends. You know, school just got back in a session. Right. So for the summer, we, we took a lot of time off, um, from the ride program to save up rides for the school year. Um, but you know, in a given month, it can be a few hundred to a few thousand. Wow. Um, we work with programs, so, oh, I uh, see. you know, we work with programs to, to see what needs they have, um, to get kids from schools to their program and then home. Um, because these programs are, are great. They're actually well-funded frequently. They, uh, provide a lot of services to a lot of kids, but they find that attendance is low despite having those resources mm. because of transportation. That's a big problem for sure. But, uh, owning their own bus is an extremely expensive, uh, venture, you know, right. Um, some programs have tried to own vans and stuff, and uh, all of a sudden a transmission goes out, and they're like, "What do you What do you mean that's twenty three hundred bucks?" <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there is all. There's always that. Yeah. Uh, AJ, Andy's in the buses. Buses, you're in the beans. Yes. No. Well, well, I was an old journalist who's written about international econo economics and all that stuff. You come to me, however many years ago, and said, "I want to start a, co a bean company in Detroit, coffee company in Detroit." I would say. I would have said, AJ, you're nuts. There's Starbucks. There's Big B. There's all these other people, but you did it anyway. Well, yeah, you, tell us about it. I thought it was nuts, too. I thought I, I originally started with a cookie, and I thought, well, you know, I'll have a cookie. And because we had reached global uh, five minutes of fame by holding the world's longest concert in 2009, 10 years ago, to uh, bail out the auto workers, really to bring attention to the auto industry and the integral part that it played in not only our economy, but in the national economy. And uh, so we had this little cafe, this little yeah, stage. Back up. Yeah, tell us about that. You started this cafe in 2012? I started in 2007. 2007. On April Fool's Day. May April yeah. Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In Ferndale. Yeah, in Ferndale, of all places. And I thought, you know, what? I was a roofer. I was a career roofer, and I had no problems in life. I was going to retire. I had I bought a few rental homes, and uh, that was my life and i uh unfortunately came upon a windstorm uh on a july day when i was finishing up a roof and uh, it decided to blow me and my ladder 35 feet down where i crushed myself into a pickup truck and then fell onto the uh, concrete and was badly injured and uh needless to say i recovered but doctors uh, strongly advised me to find a job that didn't require a ladder so i you only had one kidney I, left at that point i, I lost a right. kidney and a, a few other parts but uh, you know what <laughs> you work with what you got right. uh, so years ago there was a powerful speaker of the <laughs> michigan house before a term limits named gary owen i said well, how'd you get into politics i sat down with him one time he said i was a roofer <laughs> and then happened then winter happened <laughs> It's an amazing, uh, you know, uh, my motto for any roofer out there is to stay in school because uh, really it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a young man's job. And I, I was way past my prime still doing it, but it was, right. it was a living and I was kind of segueing into the rental housing business when the accident happened. Mm. So I really um, kind of bounced off that and found out that uh, 
you know, really, I better, I better look for a, a, another job. And I ended up in a cafe in Ferndale thinking, you know, what could be so hard? I'll just run this cafe. And Did you have any restaurant experience? Before? I had no restaurant experience whatsoever other than being a busboy at uh, uh, the Ponderosa when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, no concept at all. I mean, right. I, I bought this rundown bohemian cafe in Ferndale that was called Zato's. It was a, uh, it was a hangout for broke people. That liked music right. and uh, wanted to make out on the couch, you know. And uh, I, I went in there thinking, all right, it's a turnkey operation. I'll spruce it up. And uh, the whole thing uh, just kind of found its way. I, I learned that uh, music was not turning the radio on. People wanted live music. People wanted to be a part of this Bohemia experience. It was kind of dying out. Um, so we ended up holding open mics, and these open mics were doing real well for a while. And one day I decided that I'd uh, give it a try myself up there. It was a slow night, so I asked the uh, open mic host, uh, Ted Burlinghoff, if he knew Danny Boy. That was the only song I really knew by heart. And I went up there and sang it. And it went over pretty good, and so I did it again. And about the fourth time I got heckled, and someone said, why don't you learn a different song? And uh, I said, well, why don't we all sing it? And then we'll put it to rest. So that turned into the world's longest Danny Boy marathon. How long did they sing Danny Boy? <laughs> we sang Danny Boy nonstop for 50 hours, over 1,000 people, 700 versions. Remember, everyone from uh, Nicaragua to uh, Los Angeles, people flew in, mostly locals, church choirs. It was, it was. I guess the pipes, the pipes were calling. They did call. They did call. And we actually had a funeral for Danny Boy. We were going to put it to rest. <laughs> That's what it, the whole thing was. It was a eulogy. It was one long eulogy. And uh, the governor came and sang and it was just, you know, so we, we had everybody sign the eulogy. That was Governor Granholm, right? right. Governor some, Granholm. some I don't, I, I can't see Rick Snyder singing Danny Boy, but you never know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Everyone was invited. Uh, in fact, you bring a good point because uh, we weren't getting a lot of, uh, interest until i put the sign up that said talent is not required and uh after Man, <laughs> i missed my chance <laughs> after that everybody felt like well what the hell anyway so, so anyway did you get the guinness book of world Records? so i uh, filed all the paperwork and eight months later i'm sitting down with a good friend of mine butch and we're uh we get this email and it says uh you know we uh recognize that you probably do have the world's longest ca uh danny boy marathon but we don't have a category for that <laughs> and we don't want a category for that why don't you try for the world's longest concert which at the time was a guitar festival in hungary at 214 hours so i thought you know what let's Andy provided transportation for that festival. <laughs> it was amazing. Andy and I, and I go way back. Andy actually sold ads for the first uh, little oh, brochure wow. that we had yeah. for that concert. Yeah. So Andy and I go way back, and uh, you know, I, I've been following Andy for years. But anyway, so uh, a guy with roofing experience with the, can only sing one song ends up holding the world's longest concert when 288 hours nonstop and uh, made global news. We were known as the little cafe that bailed out the American auto industry one cup of coffee at a time. And I thought, well, I got to tell this story. I mean, I've, I've got to do, do it in something larger than a 3,000 square foot cafe. So we closed the cafe and uh, Detroit Bold Coffee was born. Wow. And what's your slogan, Detroit Bold Coffee slogan? Awesome style coffee for hardworking humans everywhere. And you you do it in you do it in Highland Park. I do. Now, Highland Park is a place that's so impoverished the city of Detroit didn't want it. The government <laughs> wanted. So it's, that's true. The government wanted to combine Highland Park with Detroit. Detroit said, "Well, no thanks." But you're helping. Well, I was born in Highland Park, and uh, Highland Park is my home. And, and you know, good, bad, or indifferent. Right. Uh, we're all Detroiters, and uh, you know, I like to say there's a bit of Detroit in us all. I think and you're whether right. there's a problem in uh, Brightmore or there's a People in Birmingham should feel that too. I think that the effects of uh, us as a region come together by really expanding the definition of what we call our neighborhood. And that's all Detroit Bold Coffee really wanted to do was be the conduit to that conversation. We want to provide a great product, which we've been doing now for 10 years, and also remind people that Detroit is more than just a name and Detroit bold is up to you to identify. You can identify that however you want. Andy defines his bold in so many ways that I admire and you and everybody else, we all pitch in to make this a part of the solution. Right. And all I want to do is supply the coffee. 
Like Plato, the Greek philosopher, supposedly said, be nice to everybody you meet because they're fighting a hard battle you don't know about. And you guys are fighting two hard battles that you do know about. But how in the world did you break in and get a niche in this market that, I mean, there's all these companies, there's Starbucks, there's uh, um, Big B, as I said, Caribou, all these people with vast marketing budgets to, I would have thought, could crush you like a bug, and yet you're getting space on store shelves, you're in Kroger, you're in Meyer. How'd you do it? Yeah, well, I think I forced Gump my way in. I, I really just was authentic. I walked in there, and I thought that simplicity was better than sophistication, and I brought a pot of coffee into the buyer at Meyer, and he wow. uh, he uh, said, you know, I, the broker said, he doesn't want to taste your coffee. He wants to see with the size of the bag what it looks like, how much it's going to cost, what his margins are, how many cases you can bring, all this other stuff. And I said, well, you know, I don't know. I thought he'd want to taste the coffee. Anyway, the first thing he said to me was, I hope that's coffee because I haven't had mine yet today. And I thought, well, yes, it is. And I brought out some Meyer cream for the guy. And he said, you know, thank you. I don't use cream, but I'm glad you brought Meyer. And that whole thing, he, he said, let me noodle it. Uh, I like it. It was my my coffee bags were fashioned to look like lunch bags, like ah. you're going to work, because I wanted people to know that this was this was working class. It was premium working class Joe, and the people who are the working class of our society are extraordinary people who do ordinary things to make us all work and make us right. all viable. Right. There's always been a place where you made things, Detroit, mm -hmm. and people made things with their hands, and that's what makes the city great. Andy, do you drink Detroit Bold? Oh, absolutely, yeah. But it, it's, absolutely. It's, I have to say, I don't want to do a free, I guess I shouldn't do a free commercial, but I will anyway. It's remarkably good coffee. Thank you. And, and you're an Eastern market every, every, every Saturday. Well, so. as, as, you know, Andy's model is, is fantastic, and, and he mentioned uh, Tom's shoes, and I think we, we all, as Detroiters, have all bailed each other out all the time. And I to Eastern Market on Saturday so that I can give back. That's my day to give back. So then we we uh, have coffee for the homeless in Cass Park on Sunday. Wow. And the money that goes in the fishbowl gets put in and the proceeds get... So yeah. we all are really part of the solution. Someone from right. Bloomfield is putting a buck in that fishbowl right. and unbeknownst to them, they just bought a homeless person a cup of coffee. Now, what I like, both you guys... Uh, you're grassroots, you're doing it from the ground up, doing it without a lot of huge funding, uh, which is remarkable to me. And I also want both of you to sort of talk about Detroit. You know, Andy, you mentioned that they, they were supposed to have this light rail that ran from the city to the suburbs. They ended up building what they call the Q line, mm -hmm. which, as I cynically say, goes from one place where there aren't any jobs to another place where there aren't any jobs. It doesn't get to the suburbs. What if uh, Duggan asked you seriously, or if Senator Stamina or Peters asked you seriously, what does Detroit, how do you solve Detroit transportation needs? What would you say? Oh, I mean, that's an easy one, is we fund the Regional Transit Authority. You know, it's right. a... The one that was voted down nearly in 2016. Yeah, yeah. We had the millage in 2016 that failed, and mostly because of uh, uh, L. Brooks and, and Hackle in the suburbs saying, we don't need right. it, we don't want it. Uh, Smart came up with a couple services, like Fast, to try to show, like, no, no, we got this handled, this is good. Um, but the RTA's plan is really robust. I mean, it's, it's right. bus rapid transit lines all over the region, uh, you know, bus rapid transit to the airport, uh, maybe even light rail or heavy rail. Um, I mean, there's tons of plans there, but the regional transit authority is like how regions uh, develop good transit, and we've got one. You know, we we voted to. to it was very close. It was fifty one forty nine. So close. I thought the I thought their marketing campaign was horrible. It was so close. Yeah. yeah and well, the, and the leadership of the RTA at the time uh, didn't inspire confidence. You know, people right. saw it as kind of. Uh, you know, wasteful politics as usual. Right. Um, you know, I think the RTA is going to try harder if it wants to, you know, get funded right. in that. Um, it's got to have the right leadership, and I'm not sure who that is uh, right now. Well, but. there's a glimmer of hope because Dave Coulter succeeded the late Brooks Patterson is on board with this. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And with the with the power of Oakland County behind the RTA, I think we've got a chance. Um, it just uh, Oakland County is also the county with opt out communities. You know, they've right. have cities that have voted to not be a part of transit, and funding the RTA would mean uh, uh, likely losing the uh, opt out ability. Right. So you're gonna you know, even though we've got Dave uh, Coulter on our side. Uh, we've got a lot of folks who who just passionately don't want transit. You right. know, they've got the the luxury BMW SUV in the garage. They don't want a dime to go towards transit, and and more importantly, they see it as a way for people who aren't them to get to their community. You know, they they um you know see it as a as a conduit for uh you know which all is not which is want. just nonsense. I heard some kid at, on the radio at, at Macomb uh, Community College after the last vote saying, "Well, 
I voted against it because I don't want those meth addicts coming mm -hmm. to sell meth in Macomb, Macomb County. It's just silliness. It's, it's silly. And, and what they don't think about is that, you know, if you ha have a, a nanny that works for you, uh, you know, right. he or she takes public transit. Uh, if you have uh, Coney Island on the corner you go to, you know, some of those workers, they take public transit. Uh, so it's for people to actually come in and provide for you and, uh, you know, be a part of this whole capitalist See, thing we got going I, on. I don't have to worry because when I was 65, I got rid of my nanny. I thought I could do things on my own now. But uh, a lot of people still, ha <laughs> still, still, still have them. AJ, what do you think? I mean, you're down in the, you're in Highland Park of all places. You live in Hazel Park, which is not, you know, the most affluent community. It's a you know, wonderful place in many ways. What's the city need to do? I mean, what do they need to do to get to the next level? In some ways, I wouldn't say... It, Maybe low-hanging fruit is not good, but Duggan's got the street lights on. He's done some of these necessary things. But what does Detroit need to do to get to the next level? I think regionalization is actually right. the key. I mean, Highland Park is a prime location in the center of everything with a great history. I, right. I think we really need to expand. And, I, I mean, I'll reiterate your, your comment earlier about Dave Coulter. Now we've got somebody from South Oakland who really understands the regionalization necessities that will really make this town He's a former thrive. mayor of Ferndale. Former mayor of Ferndale and somebody that has been intricately involved at 8 Mile Road. You know, 8 Mile Road has been our Berlin Wall for so long. Right. We have to change the Some perception. guy named Eminem had a song about that, I think. Uh, You're the young, struggling musician somewhere. This, this whole idea of us versus them has right. got to go. I mean, we we say there's a bit of Detroit in us all. You know, we sell our coffee online to every state in the country. Wow. There is a love affair with Detroit that is so, people want us to win. And we have to do things like what Andy's doing and things like other people are doing that bring our town together. Look, at we're, we're on Woodward Avenue. This is the main vein going northward, the, the, the history, I, I write a little blog about the history of every road, every town that touches 8 Mile and Woodward, and the commonalities that we share are far more vast than the differences that we have. And we just have to understand that we are all in this together. And you're correct, I mean, the, the people that have to come up and down uh, Woodward Avenue to get to work every day need a solid way to get there and it right you know these things are changing the uh, the fact is is that you've got the car capital of the world here right and it's that's that's more than just a statement we have overcome so much to retain that and we've done that through the hard work of everybody from the janitor to the corporate head well maybe what we should do is start thinking of it as the transportation capital of the world I think, that that's a, I think that's a, a perfect analogy and a perfect segue. And the thing is, we all drink coffee, and we all have this standard. And my idea was to bring premium and the idea that we were as good as anybody else out right. there and let people know that Detroit is... You know, we picked it up to a notch where we build cars as good as anyone in the world. We, we, right. We have the ability to expand, and we have more forward-thinking people that have the thought that the RTA is viable. It used to be where they thought that was c competing with their automobiles, and they didn't want any trans right. mass transit. I mean, this used to be one of the most beautiful lines that ran from Detroit to Pontiac down Woodward Avenue right through the center, and people from all Well, the neighbors. fact of the matter is, is there are people in Detroit who need jobs, don't have transportation, the jobs are in the suburbs, and they need a way to get there. Absolutely. And, and, and we don't have that now, and you guys are both trying to do something about it. Final question, Andy, where do you want to be in 10 years? Oh, man, you're going to give me an anxiety attack. I, I mean, in terms, I mean, in terms, <laughs> and not, I don't want you to say, like, on a beach with a coconut, drink yeah, something out of yeah. coconut. Where do you want to be in terms of no, business? That's, that's not what I want. Um, you know, we... I don't think the Detroit bus company, I mean, by name needs to expand beyond our region here. You know, I got a lot of folks asking me, are you going to do this in other cities? There's lots of other cities that need, you know, better transit. 
Um, you know, so I, I think much like the Zingerman's model, we're going to, you know, make the Detroit bus company the best uh, uh, local company it can be with a location of one. Um, you know, I, I see us doing more of, I see us scaling what we're doing because right now um, we give, I'd say, a fraction of the rides that we're asked to give by programs. Um, you know, we need a lot more support in that regard. and We're making it ourselves. Um, you know, I'm not into chasing down grants. Um, and uh, we've got some wild ideas. You know, there's not a good electric bus on the market right now. Uh, there's just, there's simply not. They're all bad. Um, they're all extremely overpriced and not reliable. Um, and so I've actually talked to a few people about what would it take to open up a small shop manufacturing electric buses from scratch. And, uh, you know, you, you tell that idea to some people and they think you're crazy. And you, you talk to people who are in the industry and, and know this stuff and they go, you know, actually, like, the tides are just right right now to make that to make that happen. So in 10 years, you might see us with a little bus factory. AJ, what's your ultimate dream? I think that um, I'd like to see Detroit known as far more than just the automobile capital of the world. I mean, when we first started, I said, we're going to create a new economy in our own backyard, and it's going to be with coffee. That's my contribution to the expanding of what Detroit is known as. We're beginning to be known. Of course, we've always been known as our music. We've always been known for our cars, but we've, there's so much more. And our coffee has been supplying the United States military for the last 100 years without anybody even knowing it. You know, so we, we have to ex expand and tell our story. I want Detroit Bold to be known as the awesome style coffee for hardworking humans everywhere. Do you have a website people would read more about you? Sure. Go to DetroitBoldCoffee.com, and uh, there's all kinds of great stuff in there. To read. And how about the Detroit Bus Company? Oh, we've got the TheDetroitBus.com, T-H-E, DetroitBus.com, because they want five grand for DetroitBus.com, and he's well, not paying that ransom. <laughs> <laughs> so, so put what, a the in front of it. What again, what, once again, what's the right one, the Detroit Bus? Uh, the TheDetroitBus.com. Gotcha. Andy DeRossi, A.J. O'Neill. Honored to know you both. Keep on doing what you're doing and drinking coffee while you're doing it and take the bus whenever you can. Well, that's about it for now, except for my signature essay coming up. Um, by the way, I want to thank everyone who donated to help fund the production costs of this podcast, including Jeffrey Fire. I've tried to cover honestly for years and Federal Judge Avon Cohn. And if you want to contribute still, you can do so directly at Zing Media Group, 186 North Main Street, Plymouth, Michigan, 48170, or message me on Facebook or via my blog for more details or via my email, bucca, B-U-C-C-A at AOL.com. Well, that's about it for now, except for my signature essay coming up. Also, please check out my blog, LessonberryInc.com. That's ink as an ink pen. Click the button, subscribe. The price is right, free. You'll have more money for bus rides and coffee. And listen to our next episode soon. Tell your friends and feel free to send me a message on Facebook or via email with ideas. And in the meantime, I'm off to change the ribbon on my old manual Underwood typewriter and figure out our next podcast, which will be soon. I'll see you then. There's sometimes danger in knowing too much. For example, I know all sorts of reasons why a young guy without a business degree could never possibly start a successful transportation business in Detroit. I also know that it might even be even more nuts to think that a former roofer could start a successful coffee company in the era of Starbucks, Big B, and a bunch of other big national and international chains and do so without one course in business in his life. Yet both of them did it, maybe because they never even stopped to think they could possibly fail. They're both smart and hard-working guys, to be sure. They also have a lot of instinctive common sense. A.J. O'Neill is a national salesman and a showman. He could probably sell sand futures in Saudi Arabia. Andy Diderosi has the knack of looking at complex problems and seeing the need for common sense solutions. I believe in the bus, he told me last June. The idea that self-driving cars are going to take care of our transportation needs is just ridiculous. Well, of course he's right. Top automotive engineers have told me that while there may be some urban zones that will have self-driving vehicles, the idea that we'll all be able to have a driverless car take us anywhere isn't going to happen, not in our lifetimes. There's a reason that Lyft and Uber have caught on. As Andy says, shared transit is not only more affordable, it's the best way to meet people, decrease traffic congestion, and decrease our impact on the environment. Well, of course it is. I'm convinced that if Andy had been charged of marketing the Regional Transit Authority three years ago, the voters would have passed the necessary legislation for an area-wide rapid bus system. A.J. O'Neill, on the other hand, knows coffee, 
New Detroit suddenly had cachet again and sensed instinctively that the time was right to bring the two concepts together. So he found the Detroit Bold in cleverly marketing it as awesome style coffee for hardworking humans everywhere and wouldn't take no for an answer. Today, his coffee's in Kroger stores, Myers, and AJ is out there incessantly hustling it. You can find him almost every Saturday in Detroit's Eastern Market from where he sends a Facebook message to the entire city at the first gray light of dawn saying simply, wake up. By the way, I'm a serious hardcore coffee addict and I can't get enough of Detroit Bowl. Both these guys are hiring people who didn't have jobs and putting them to work. They aren't going to revive the metropolitan area's economy by themselves, but they're not waiting for someone else to do it either. Robert F. Kennedy once said that each time someone acts to improve the lot of others, he sends out a tiny ripple of hope, ripples which can combine with other ripples from a million different centers of energy and daring. AJ and Andy are doing their part. What about you? This is Jack Lessonberry. I'll see you next time.